everyone and welcome back to my videos on FIRST Robotics Programming. If you remember last time we made this ball delivery subsystem that has two motors to shoot the ball or pick up a ball and some pistons that can raise and lower the ball delivery subsystem. In this video we're going to be making the next two subsystems which will be our hatch delivery and our drivetrain. So first we're going to get started by making our hatch delivery subsystem. So to start off this subsystem I'm just going to right click on this copy and then right click on our subsystems folder and paste in order to just make a copy of our previous subsystem and then I'll right click rename this to hatch delivery and so now once we're in this file we can delete all the stuff in the middle and rename our file to hatch delivery like that all right so we have our empty class and we're ready to start making our hatch delivery so if you remember from earlier, our hatch delivery is the subsystem that grabs the hatch panels from the side of the field and is able to place them on the side of the cargo base. So in order to do this, we actually have two pneumatic components to this. The first part is an extender that can reach the subsystem forward and backwards. We also have a grabber that opens and closes horizontally in order to grab the hatch panel. So let's get started making both of those objects. First, we're gonna make the grabber that opens and closes and so this actually is another double solenoid toggler like this. I'm going to call it grabber solenoid. I'm going to make this equal to robot map dot grabber solenoid. Awesome. So if you go into our robot map file, we can see that we've already made this grabber solenoid over here and it's just equal to another new double solenoid toggler one and zero. And so those would be the ports that we're using for our grabber. Now going back to our hatch delivery, our extender solenoid is actually a little bit more complicated. So this is actually going to be a floatable solenoid like this. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later, but for now I'm gonna call it extender solenoid equals robot map dot extender solenoid. And you can kind of imagine this floatable solenoid like your arm. It can extend and it can retract but you can also just kind of let it go limp and flop all over the place. And so that's basically what a floatable solenoid does as well. It has a third mode called float mode where you can actually move it around however you want to. And so our team uses this in order to detect when we're touching the hatch panel. And so how we do that is we have a limit switch, which is just another device that will activate when our extender gets pushed in past a certain amount. So how our strategy works to grab the hatch panel is first we bring our extender out all the way and then we set it into this float mode. And so this means that when we hit the wall, our piston will actually start to be pushed back. And that means our limit switch can detect when it gets pushed back far enough and then we know that we're touching the hatch panel. And so at that time, we open our grabber and pull back all the way. And so we know that our hatch panel is on the robot. So to add our limit switch, we're going to say private digital input limit switch equals new digital input and then we also have this port in our robot map as well HD limit switch port so this limit switch is a digital input which means that it is plugged into the DIO pins on the Robo Rio and can only give us two values true or false it will just tell us when our extender solenoid has been pushed in and is touching the hatch panel so now we have our extender, our grabber, our limit switch. And the last thing that we have on this subsystem is the compressor. So we actually have pneumatics on our ball delivery as well, but you'll notice we didn't put a compressor in this class. And that's actually just because our robot normally would only have one compressor on it. So you can choose kind of which subsystem you want to include that code in. And our team just happened to put it in our hatch delivery because it has a lot more pneumatics going on. So to do a compressor, we'll just say private compressor C equals new compressor. And again, we'll click on that control period and import it like this. And if you remember from the last video, we need to call a method on our compressor to get it to start up. So we'll do that in the constructor public hatch delivery. We're going to say C dot set closed loop control. And we're going to turn that to true in order to turn our compressor on at the start of the match. All right, so now it's time to add our methods into the hatch delivery subsystem. 
If you remember earlier when I explained how we actually grab the hatch panel using this subsystem, it's pretty complicated. And it's actually a lot more complicated than we should be putting in our subsystem methods, because those are supposed to be really simple and only doing one thing at a time. So rather than making all of that in our methods here, I'm actually just going to make some simple methods for our extender and grabber. So first we're going to say public void open grabber. And this one is just going to be grabber solenoid dot extend like this. So this is the kind of methods that we do put in our subsystem class. Just a simple one line method. This open grabber method will open the grabber solenoid. And then in the opposite way, we're going to make another one called close grabber. And this one will call the retract method on our grabber solenoid. And just like before, we can make a Boolean method that will return true if our grabber is open and false if it's closed. So that would look something like this, public Boolean is grabber open. And this will just return grabber solenoid dot extended like that. All right. So now we have our grabber methods and it's time to move on to our A extender methods. So the floatable solenoid is actually a little bit more complicated when it comes to extending and retracting. But what I will do for now is make a method that does the float command because that actually isn't as complicated. So this one will be called public void float extender. And for this, I'll just say extender solenoid dot float piston. And so this will just set our extender solenoid into float mode like that. In the next video, when we talk about commands, I'll show you how we actually extend and retract this floatable solenoid. But for now, let's just make another method that will tell us whether our extender is currently extended or not. And we'll just say public boolean is extended. And this is going to return extender solenoid dot is extended like that. And so this will just let us know if our subsystem is currently extended or retracted. So now we have all of our methods for all of the pneumatics on the subsystem. The only thing we need to do now is work with our limit switch. And luckily that isn't too hard either. So we'll just make a simple method. And this is going to just return a Boolean because our limit switch can only give true or false values. We'll call it get limit switch. And this is just going to return limit switch dot get. So that's pretty simple as well. So as you can see here, our subsystem class really doesn't have too much fancy logic going on. All it is, is keeping track of our actuators, so our floatable solenoid, double solenoid, and our limit switch, and making some simple methods that are a little bit more readable too, that allow other commands and subsystems to interact with our actuators. Awesome, so if you followed along so far, we've now finished our hatch delivery class, and we've made two out of our three subsystems. For the last one, we're going to make our robot's drivetrain. And this is arguably the most important subsystem on our robot because it's actually what lets our robot get from place to place on the field. So just like before, I'm gonna right click our hatch delivery, copy, right click our subsystems folder, and then paste just to get a new subsystem file here. I'm gonna delete all the stuff in the middle. And I'm gonna rename this file to drivetrain.java and rename our class to drivetrain as well. We can remove all these imports that we don't need. So for a drivetrain, the only actuators that we need are motors. There's not gonna be any pneumatics or anything fancy like that. All we do is have a set of motors that are working together in order to move the robot in different ways. And luckily in this WPI lib library, there are a lot of functions that can help make this a little bit easier. So first we're going to make an instance of a class called differential drive. And so differential drive is basically a fancy way of saying a drive that has two sides that work independently. So we can move the left motors or we can move the right motors. And so by having this differential drive that allows our robot to do all kinds of things like turn around, drive forwards, backwards, spin around on the spot, anything like that. And so we're gonna call this one drive system. And it's going to be equal to robot map dot drive system. So we've actually made this differential drive class over in our robot map file. So let's go look at that. Whoa, there's a lot going on here. So at the very top, we have two arrays, left group and right group. 
And so this is just an array of ints. So the first left group has zero, 01 and our right group has 8 and 9. So nothing's really new here. We still have the ports that our motor controllers are plugged into. It's just a little bit different because we actually have two motors per side. So we have this list of two ports. So we have a left motor plugged into 0 and 1 and then right motor controllers plugged into ports 8 and 9. So now that we have our left group and right group, we're using what's called this speed controller group class here. And this takes in our robotmap.leftgroup0 and robotmap.leftgroup1. This Spark class is kind of like Victor, it's just another brand of motor controller that we happen to be using for our motors. And the speed controller group is a fancy class that allows you to combine multiple motor classes into one group. And so this group can just be controlled with the exact same methods as a normal motor is, but it will actually control all of the motors at a time. So I could say left motor group dot set one, and it would set all the motors in that group to one. So when we make a differential drive system, we want all the left side motors to be working together, and we want all the right side motors to be working together. So it just makes it a lot easier if we use this speed controller group class to handle that for us. And I'll move the file over to the side here. If you want to see this half of the line, you can pause the video. And you can see that our groups are basically the exact same other than we have a left group here and a right group on this line. And now for the final line where we actually create our differential drive object, all we're doing here is passing in our left motor group and our right motor group here. And that's all our differential drive needs in order to work. We can go back to our drivetrain class and we can see that we're storing our robot map drive system into our drive system variable. So if you remember from our ball delivery subsystem, there's an issue with the controllers where even though they're in the middle, it might not always give an exact value of zero. But luckily this differential drive class has a really easy way to deal with that. So what I'll do is I'll first make our constructor here. And then inside this, all I need to do is say drive system dot set dead band. And I can make this equal to 0.1 and that will actually handle all of that code for us. And that means our drivetrain will not be activated unless our value from the controller is bigger than 0.1. So now we're ready to actually get our differential drive class working and moving our robot. So all we need to do is create a method here and we're going to call this one arcade drive. So arcade drive is just a certain way of driving the robot where your left hand can move up and down to control whether the robot moves forwards and backwards and then your right hand will move from side to side in order to turn the robot from left to right. And so as a parameter we're actually going to put in an Xbox controller class and we'll call it driver controller because in first we actually have two controllers one for the driver and one for the operator who will work more with the subsystems. So we'll make this method here. And there's two values we want to get here. We want to get our forward power and our turn power from this driver controller object. And both of these will be doubles that will go from negative one up to one. So first we'll say double forward power equals driver controller dot get y. And then in here we will type hand dot k left. And so what this means is we'll get the Y axis of the left joystick, which is exactly what we want. So if they move the joystick up, this number will be equal to one and our forward power will be equal to one. If they move it down, our forward power will be actually negative one and that will cause the robot to drive backwards. So for our turn power, we're gonna make this equal to driver controller dot get X. And so this will just do the horizontal axis instead of get Y, which does the vertical axis. And we're going to use the right hand for this one. Now, obviously if your team wants to do some different values here, you're welcome to change it. It doesn't have to be the left hand that does the forward and backwards. You could make that the right if you wanted to. But now we have our two variables of our forward power and our turn power. And believe it or not, we actually only need one more line in order to finish off this method. And that is drive system dot arcade drive. And we'll just put in our forward power and our turn power into this method. Now you can actually also do some interesting things with this method if you want to have a little bit more control over your driving. 
So what one thing that our team has done in the past is have a button that allows your robot to move a little bit slower. If you want to make a really controlled turn. So what we did is we said if driver controller dot get bumper hand dot K left. Since there are two bumpers on the left and right hand side, you have to specify which one. And then we'll say turn power times equals 0.5. And this will have the effect of slowing down the turn speed if you're pressing the left bumper on the controller. So this allows you to have a little bit more control and make slower turns and so you can have your robot turned to a precise angle. So you can do all kinds of things like this in your drive method if you want to add some extra functionality to the driver controller. And in fact, even though arcade drive is what our team likes to use, there's actually some other methods that you can use here. So for example, drive system dot tank drive. And so this one takes in a left speed and a right speed. So this would use one joystick to control the left side and one joystick to control the right side. So if you wanted your robot to drive forward, you'd have to push both joysticks up. If you wanted to drive backwards, you'd have to bring both joysticks down. So it's just another way of driving the robot. Our team has always preferred using this arcade drive, but you can look at some of the other methods if there's one that you think you'd like better. And finally, another good idea for a drivetrain is to have a stop method. And so this one will be pretty simple, public void stop. And all we'll do here is say drive system dot stop motor. And that's just a handy method that will stop all of the motors. In case something goes wrong for whatever reason, you can always call the stop method, which will stop the drivetrain and the robot entirely, which can be good to have for safety reasons on your robot. And so that's all we need for our drivetrain. It's actually pretty simple considering it's one of the most important subsystems on your robot. So with our drivetrain finished, we're actually all done the three subsystems for our robot. In the next video, we're going to look at commands and how we take our input from the driver and operator controller and use it to control different actions on the robot. We'll also look at how you can chain some of these subsystem commands together in order to make much more complicated actions for your robot. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.